Hi, everyone. This is Meg Sheehan. I am on a landline. I'm sorry I can't be on video conference with you. My bandwidth um, here is not very good. But I am the coordinator for the North American Mega Dam Resistance Alliance. We're a volunteer network of groups and individuals whose mission is protecting rivers and their communities by resisting mega dams in their transmission corridors. Thank you for joining our webinar tonight. The title is the proposed Gull Island Mega Dam in Labrador and why it's a bad deal for communities, the environment, and the climate. We'll be talking about two existing dams on the Grand River in Labrador in Eastern Canada. The Grand River is also called the Churchill River, originally called the Mistashipu River by the Aboriginal people who lived there. So you'll be hearing us call it by probably all three names. Some webinar tips, we're all probably familiar with Zoom, but we do have a helpline if you're on a phone and you'd like to dial in or text to see uh, whether any problems that you have, the number is 802-238-7496. With questions, we'll be using the chat box at the end or you can just raise your hand. Resources and reference materials are available in our Google Drive link, which we will put in the chat box as well. We wanted to let you know about our upcoming webinars, three of them, two hosted by the Sierra Club chapter in Maine, one on September 22nd and one on October 27th. You can see the topics there. Our past webinars, five of them, are on our YouTube channel. We have done a number of different topics. We had a three-part series in June and July focusing on why importing Canadian hydroelectricity via the transmission corridor through New York is a bad deal for New York, the climate, and frontline communities. And we also want to point your attention to our short film, which is also on our YouTube channel, and it's called Voices of the Resistance, and talks about the corridors and hydroelectricity and impacts on communities in Canada. And there you can hear directly from the, our frontline community members and the Indigenous communities who live with this hydropower day to day. Tonight's agenda is myself. Obviously, we'll have Amy Norman, an Indigenous community member from Labrador, Roberta Benefiel, also from Labrador from the Grand Riverkeeper, and we'll have Dr. Ian Gowdy, who was involved in the environmental assessment of the impacts on the Muskrat Falls Dam, and he'll be talking about the problems with that environmental assessment system and process in Canada. My next slide is a map of the two existing dams and the third dam on the Churchill River. You'll see the upper Churchill, which is already in, existing, in existence. Right now, Hydro-Quebec system, about one-sixth of Hydro-Quebec system gets of hydroelectricity from this dam, and that is going to be happening until 2041. The dam went online in 1974. This particular dam drains 27,000 square miles of forest and river systems. It has a 2,000 square mile reservoir that's the size of Ireland. You can see here a picture of the Upper Churchill Dam from the sky. Thank you to Roberta for this photograph here. Um, the Upper Churchill is very profitable for Hydro-Quebec in 2018. About $1.2 billion of profits came from the Upper Churchill River Dam. And this is, again, of course, also the Grand River or the Mistashipu River. This dam was built in the 1970s without the knowledge or consent of the Labrador Innu. They are currently challenging the New England Clean Energy Connect corridor um, and asserting claims to this electricity and the profits from it. The second dam on the Churchill River, dam number two, is the Muskrat Falls Mega Dam or phase two of the lower, phase one of the lower Churchill project. 
you'll be hearing from Roberta about that. That's 824 megawatts. This next map is intended to show the way that hydroelectricity from Muskrat Falls and potentially from Gull Island could be transmitted to the Upper Churchill Station and mingled in with the rest of Hydro-Quebec supply that it is taking out of the Grand River. So there's also already an existing 500 megawatt transmission line that connects Muskrat Falls to the Upper Churchill, which is in turn linked to Hydro-Quebec's network. The next slide shows proposed dam number, dam number three, Gull Island, the focus of our talk tonight. This is the site of the Gull Island Mega Dam, and our hope and wish is that this remains like it is in the photograph here that you see. This electricity is being proposed for export. Um, four of the currently proposed corridors are shown here on this map, going to New York and Boston. The corridors are approved in the US without consideration of any of the impacts in Canada. There's never been any regulatory proceeding in the US that looked at the impacts of the production of this hydroelectricity on rivers, forests, communities, or the climate in Canada. This is a serious regulatory flaw, and we'll be talking further about that. This isn't the case just in Eastern Canada. This map shows that there are mega dams proposed across Canada. On the, on the West Coast, we have British BC Hydro's Site C Dam in British Columbia. Very problematic dam. Recent events have um, caused people to speculate that this dam might be abandoned after spending tens of billions of dollars. Some proposed reading, a quote, uh, I have a link there at the end to an editorial um, in the Vancouver Sun that gives an overview of that if you're interested in learning more. In Manitoba, we have the Kiosk Dam under construction. If you want to learn more about the impacts of that on local communities, very good article and series um, in APTN News called Power Failure and the Impacts of Hydro Dams in Nor Northern Manitoba. So you might be asked to consider what is going on here. Well, Canada already has 15,000 hydro dams that have flooded vast forests, river systems, and degraded land to the point where it cannot sustain human habitation. Many of the communities that are living with these mega dams have no access to clean water because the water systems are so degraded that they are polluted um, due to the manipulation of the water and stagnation and so forth. This has been going on for 100 years. No one has ever seriously looked at the cumulative impacts of the destruction of hundreds of thousands of square miles for this type of resource extraction. Ongoing import impacts include erosion, impacts on biodiversity, impacts on communities, and loss of traditional life ways. According to the Canadian government, um, testimony under oath recently, they explicitly stated their intent to develop 60% 60, 60 more of Canada's hydroelectricity capacity. 22 dams are planned or under construction. This is greenwashing by the Canadian government, the hydropower industry, and US politicians and regulators who are complicit. This electricity is being considered and called renewable. There is no legally defensible grounds for that. It's based on the childlike view that because precipitation keeps falling out of the sky, the electricity that it produces when it goes through a power turbine is renewable. This ignores the impacts on the surrounding ecosystem and the displacement of communities. It ignores the permanent destruction of forests, rivers, and biodiversity. It's also being greenwashed as low carbon or even zero carbon, uh, which was a lie under oath by New England Clean Energy Connect, 
promoters in Massachusetts had the audacity to call it zero emissions. There is no site-specific carbon accounting of the emissions from these 15,000 dams. Despite, the, despite that fact, Hydro Quebec and the state of Massachusetts and the governor of Maine continue to promote this as clean energy when there is absolutely no credible data to support those claims. The data that is available shows that half of Hydro Quebec's dams have carbon emissions that are on par with fossil fuels. There's a carbon accounting loophole both in state laws and in state greenhouse gas inventories, including in Massachusetts and in the, in the international UN IPCC frameworks for um, calculating carbon emissions globally. And there's no one looking at the impacts on these dams and the both past and future on the ability of Canada's forests to the cluster carbon. The dark side of Canadian hydropower was exposed in the US International Trade Commission investigation. NAMRA has a post about this on the website in which we provide a roadmap to this investigation in which we have asked for a uh, thorough investigation of the greenwashing claims by the Canadian hy hydropower industry and the Canadian, Canadian government. Some of the most compelling testimony in the investigation hearing was from Senator Mary Jane McCallum, a Barrensland First Nation community member and senator who has lived through and seen firsthand the impacts of hydropower development on indigenous communities. And she asked, from what I have seen firsthand, how can we possibly call the energy produced by hydro mega dams green, clean, or most importantly, ethical? She refers to this environment as environmental racism, and there is much information to document those claims. With that, I will turn it over to Amy Norman, who's our next speaker. Amy will be speaking to us from her home in Labrador, 1,200 miles away. And the subarctic with the landscape is sequestering carbon and boreal forests and rivers, and she's working to make sure that it stays that way. Thank you. Thanks, Meg. Um, hi, so my name is Amy Norman. I'm going to just set up my slides real quick. Um, so, is this working? That's a good question. Here we go. Let me just do this. All right. Is that working for everyone? Can you give me a thumbs up? You can see my slides. Good. Good. Thanks, Roberta. I'm going to do that. Thumbs up. Okay. So, I'm going to do a quick overview on um, methylmercury contamination the infringement on indigenous rights by the Muskrat Falls Mega Dam, and then what that means for Gull Island. So about me, um, my name is Amy Norman, and like Meg said, I'm an Inuk from Labrador. I'm originally, um, well, I'm born and raised here in Happy Valley Goose Bay. That's where I am right now. I joined up with the Labrador Land Protectors in 2016 at kind of like the height of the Muskrat Falls resistance. Um, and I'm really focused on how mega dams impact indigenous rights and specifically on how it impacts, you know, my Inuit culture and, you know, my family's way of life. So let's talk about methylmercury. I know, like, I recognize a lot of the names here who are joining us, but not everyone. So we're going to kind of go through everything like you've never heard it before. Methylmercury, um, it's a harmful neurotoxin and it can cause what's called Minimata disease. So it, it affects the body in all kinds of ways. Basically, um, it can cause developmental disorders in children. It can cause numbness in your hands and feet, um, memory issues, hearing and speech problems, all kinds of things. And mercury is naturally occurring in all vegetation. And when that vegetation is submerged in water, 
that's when it converts into the harmful methylmercury form. And this is particularly harmful to Inuit because the way that methylmercury um, works, basically it bioaccumulates in fat. So it builds up and builds up in the um, fat of animals. And Inuit traditional diet is very rich in fat. So you can see here, um, you know, down at the bottom, it starts with the mercury that's in the water, and then which goes into the plankton, and then the larger animals, the smaller fish, the larger fish, seals, and then it's us. We eat the seals, we eat the salmon, we eat everything, right? Um, we really depend on these, our traditional diets. And um, so that's why it's particularly harmful to Inuit, if, but, um, because we still rely on hunting and fishing and harvesting. You know, our traditional diet provides us with a constant source of good, healthy food. And that's so important because here in the North, there's so much food insecurity. Um, you know, store-bought food is so expensive and we can't depend on it. It costs too much. Uh, so we have to continue to rely on the diet, you know, just as our ancestors have our food webs are being contaminated. And this is severing not only our links to our traditional diet, but it's severing our links to our culture because our traditional foods, it's not just, you know, it's not just food. It, it nourishes our mind and our body and our, our spirit. It's who we are. Um, so before Muskrat Falls, back in 2016, mercury levels of Inuit around Lake Melville were already two to 2.5 times higher than the Canadian average. This is because of the decades of methylmercury buildup from the Churchill Falls Reservoir, the one that's the first dam on the river, 300 kilometers upstream from Lake Melville, so like where I am right now. Um, so we're starting you know, at a very higher baseline than the average Canadian. Um, Muskrat Falls, according to the work done by Harvard University in partnership with N the Nunatsis of government, Muskrat Falls is estimated to further increase mercury levels by up to 1,500%. And if we add a third dam into the equation, you know, Gull Island is only going to increase these levels even more, and it's going to push Inuit into a critically dangerous level of mercury exposure. Um, to briefly address some of the uh, impacts around Indigenous rights, you know, we can't overlook the fact that land protectors, water protectors, we are over criminalized. Um, you know, as Indigenous land protectors, we are targeted more by um, the court system, by the judicial system, by the police systems. Um, you know, there's over 70 of us Labrador land protectors that have been charged or arrested. I've personally been charged and arrested twice. You know, we've had our elders sent to maximum security facilities over a thousand kilometers from home. We have a young Inuk woman who was violently arrested in the middle of the night. You know, it's, and it's, you know, this is not unique to the Muskrat Falls Project. This is all over um, anywhere where there's indigenous land and water protectors. You know, just like a half hour before we started this, I had the news that my friend was arrested on her homeland just today for trying to protect her homeland from development that they didn't consent to. So, you know, it's an ongoing issue any time that there's, um, you know, these types of conflict. Um, and some of our land protectors are still being dragged through the courts. You know, over three years, we're coming on four years now since those first charges. Um, and some people are still going through that experience. So just uh, a link here to our fundraiser page. If you can contribute, that would be lovely. We do still have to pay our legal fees. Um, and then a couple other impacts on indigenous communities. So when Muscat Falls as a project was sanctioned, um, the government of Newfoundland and Labrador only consulted with the Indian nation. So the Inuit of Numatsiavut, as well as Munatuavut, never gave free, prior, and informed consent. Now, free, prior, and informed consent is required by the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, that's Article 10. And the fact that, you know, one group was consulted, but the other two weren't, 
This is sowing a lot of distrust and hard feelings between indigenous groups here in Labrador. And it's making, you know, it's making our communities quite difficult. Um, you know, meanwhile, we're talking about all these mega dams. None of the power from these dams, the two that currently exist, and then the one proposed one, none of it is actually going to any of the indigenous communities on the coast. And many of them still rely on dirty diesel energy. And the province of Newfoundland and Labrador still wants to double offshore oil production. And that's, that's just a side note, because I will forever be angry about that. But the fact is that, you know, all this development is going on our lands, on indigenous lands. It's in our backyards. We're facing the impacts. And we're not getting any of the benefits. We're not getting off of diesel. Like, it just, it's, it's so disgusting to me. And the last thing I wanted to mention specifically to Gull Island, um, every year the Inu Nation hosts their elders gathering at Gull Island. This is bringing Inu from all over Natasana and so all, all over Labrador and Quebec as well. Um, there's hundreds and hundreds of people journeying here for it. And it's a very important cultural gathering. It's always like a lovely time. I love going out to visit um, friends and stuff. And it's hosted at Gull Island. Like, I don't know what the plan is if they build this dam, but suddenly their cultural gathering is going to have to move anyway. It's it's just so frustrating. Um, so basically, to summarize everything, all of the issues we've seen with the dams at Churchill Falls and Muskrat Falls will only be further magnified by the proposed dam at Gull Island. So Gull Island is um, supposed to be this generating capacity of 2250 megawatts. Muskrat Falls is only 824. So Gull Island is going to be two times, 2.7 times bigger and 2.7 times more awful. It's not a good idea. And right now, the biggest barrier to Gull Island is Quebec. So the biggest road, this is a quote from a, a 2019 article in the Telegram. Um, the biggest roadblock for the project has been getting electricity through Quebec. Ball, that's Premier Dwight Ball, Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, says discussions are still very early, but he believes Quebec will begin to work with Newfoundland and Labrador towards making the project feasible. So what we're talking about here, it's not like, you know, some far off possibility. It might not happen. Like, no, our premiers are meeting. They have been meeting. They've been talking about this. It's the accepted phase two of the Lower Churchill project. It's going to happen in their eyes. So now what we have to do is to fight it. So I thank you for joining us in this fight. Um, that was my brief little bit, but I, um, yeah, I welcome the Q&A section. I'm gonna stop my screen sharing here. And I believe Roberta is next, so I will pass it on to Roberta. Thank you, Amy. Good presentation, appreciate it. So, uh, yeah, I'm Roberta Benefield, and um, I'm the river keeper. I've been involved with uh, <clears throat> protecting the Grand River for about 20 years. This slide right here is a picture of we paddle the river every so often, and it's a nine, 10 day trip. And this is looking downstream from uh, Fox Island where we camp. And if you take a look at the, at the both riverbanks, you'll see the forests. This is, this is for eight or nine days steady. This forest is, um, and all of that will go underwater if, uh, if Bell Island is, uh, is built. So just for, um, people who may be online from other than Canada, uh, US or other countries. I just wanna give you a little bit of a, a background on Can Canadian rivers. So we're a nation of wild and legendary rivers like the Mackenzie or the Fraser or the Grand River, which is also the Churchill River, the Nahani, and there's dozens more. They all empty into our national identity and they flow through our landscape, our history and our imagination. They're vital to any textbook. 
uh, a history textbook for a group of seven exhibit or a gift shop postcard rack. As the Canadian Hydropower Association puts it, we're a hydro superpower. So we have more than 65% of our power coming from dams. We export much of what we produce and 98% of our exports are to the United States. But we're also a nation of river tamers, unfortunately. From the 1950s to the 1980s, Canada has blasted rock, poured cement, and altered rivers in unprecedented numbers. In Quebec alone, 571 dams and control structures have altered the flow of 74 rivers. In Labrador, our own Grand River, which is the largest in Atlantic Canada, has already been altered with dikes and control structures that diverted numerous lakes and small rivers and wetlands to create the Smallwood Reservoir, which is the largest man-made lake in the world. So the province of Prince Edward Island can be dropped in the center of the Smallwood Reservoir and it would disappear, just to give you an idea of the size of that reservoir. The Nascopi River uh, runs no more because uh, when it was diverted as part of the uh, Smallwood Reservoir, um, that was the end of it. it. It has a trickle. And that diversion uh, caused the town of Northwest River's drinking water wells to become salty because the uh, salt water and infiltration from Lake Melville and the ocean water uh, uh, came into their uh, well areas and they had to move their wells up higher. Muskrat Falls is nearing completion, as Meg mentioned. Uh, it, it's creating a massive reservoir upstream just 36 kilometers from Happy Valley Goose Bay. So Grand River Keeper Labrador is an environmental non-governmental organization. We're based in central Labrador near the Grand River. The mission of our group is to protect the Grand, aka Churchill River, <laughs> from developments that do irreparable damage to her watershed and to promote sustainable de development that maintains the intrinsic value of the river and her watershed. We've been affiliated with Waterkeeper Alliance in New York since 2005 and with North American Mega Dams Resistance Alliance since 2017. So the Grand River, what's in the name? Our river has many. And as Meg mentioned in the beginning, uh, the Mr. Shippu is the Innu name which means Great or Grand River. And then we had the Southern Inuit hunters and trappers who came along and they called it Grand River, uh, which really basically means the same thing. It was also at one time called the Hamilton River. And this is, a, this is kind of a, a, a dig, but it was originally named in 1821 for Sir Charles Hamilton, who was Newfoundland's first colonial da -da, governor. The word originally is a bit of a stretch, um, since we all know the Innu traveled this river for centuries, and theirs would have been the original name, which is Mississippi. Churchill River, which appears on your maps today, was named by Joey Smallwood, a former premier for Sir, for Sir Winston Churchill, who helped with the funding of the Upper Churchill Project or the Churchill Falls Project. But Grand River Keeper, Grand River, or Mr. Shippu, is the name we all prefer to use today in Labrador. So we have political, geographical, cultural issues to contend with up here. We are owned by Newfoundland. That was a Privy Council decision in England in 1927. No consultation with the residents of Labrador. We vote for an offshore government, which is 27,000 souls in Labrador to 500,000 on the island of Newfoundland, and that rarely provides Labrador with an equitable share of tax dollars. Our natural resources are abundant in the territory of Labrador. We got nickel, copper, iron, forestry, fishing, hydropower. Yet for years and years, while I was growing up here, we lived with gravel roads or no roads at all. We're located in the north. We have too few people. We have too few jobs. And government wheels this jobs like a big stick pitting one group against the other and controlling the masses. And they do that with these projects on uh, resource extraction. There's no real industry to sustain the population. They're mostly extraction industries and value added is usually done somewhere else. Few roads to connect the communities, difficult and expensive to travel, expensive goods and services, especially groceries, like Amy mentioned. 
We're culturally very different here. We have three Aboriginal groups who are again often pitted against each other by the governments in power. The Innu, the Northern Inuit, which is Nunatsiavut, the Southern Innu Inuit, which is Nunatuavut, and then we have the settlers of European and various descents with, um, with different ideas and often it's difficult to coalesce. So just for the people that may not know uh, Canada, I just put this map up and you can see a little star up to the far middle right there. Uh, that's where we are on the continent of North America. This is a picture of the um, Grand, aka Churchill River hydro system, and you see Churchill Falls to the far left, the first red dot, and then you look at the the next red dot, well, that's where Gull Island will be. The next red dot towards the east is Muskrat Falls, and our community of Happy Valley Goose Bay is right beside it. So just a few pictures to give people who have not seen um, what the devastation is, uh, an idea of how, how all of this works. Uh, to the left is what the uh, Grand Falls or Hamilton Falls used to look like before the Upper Churchill. To the right is what it looks like today. It's barely a trickle. This is the uh, Muskrat Falls site before Nalpur. This is Muskrat Falls during Nalpur's uh, construction. Again, Muskrat Falls on the south side before Nalpur and now. This is Gull Island today. I hope it stays that way. This is looking downstream. This is what Nalpur's plan for Gull Island is. So a history and timeline timeline of environmental assessment. The 1970s, the Upper Churchill Project came on stream with, like I said, no consultation, no impact assessment. Successive governments have tampered with environmental law and we still have no real environmental protection in Canada. When the Upper Churchill Project was built by Brinko and Hydro-Quebec, no environmental assessment took place at all. Aboriginal people were not consulted. In fact, they weren't even considered. So their trapping grounds and grave sites went underwater and they didn't even warn them so they could get their traps and their canoes from, that, that they left over from season to season. Before there was actual environmental legislation in Canada, there was a cabinet order to review environmental impacts on federal decisions and that was in the early 1970s. In 1990, the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act was introduced in Parliament and became law in 1995. Dr. Gowdy will talk about how the 1995 Act worked or not for the Lower Churchill Project in at least one instance. And then there was CIA 2012, another act under the Harper government, and that was a total disaster. That came under fire by the Alberta Law Foundation, claiming it was unconstitutional. I've left you some links below to check about these uh, items if you're interested. Things are not that much different these days even. And uh, uh, Justin Trudeau has a new law um, to protect the environment, but it's called the Impact Assessment Act. They even took the word environment out of the act. It's not much better in many cases, and some cases it's even worse. So, so the road to Gull Island. Premier Dwight Ball says Gull Island will be developed for hydroelectricity, but not soon. So uh, Amy mentioned that they're having meetings um, with the uh, Quebec government, and that has happened Premier Ball, several times. Premier Ball and Premier Legault uh, discussed hydro over dinner. Uh, this came from a telegram, the Telegram, which is a newspaper in Newfoundland, um, on December 12, 2018. Uh, Ball says he, meaning Premier of Quebec, wants to see more economic activity and he wants to strengthen the relationship. He really was interested in talking about hydro. So I underlined that section. Now, you have to know that uh, for, for years, ever since the upper, the lower, yes, the upper Churchill was, was brought on stream, there's been really serious conflict between Newfoundland and uh, the government of Quebec and Hydro-Quebec because Hydro-Quebec caught them in a really um, uh, difficult financial state and forced a contract where Newfoundland makes very little money and Hydro-Quebec makes millions, billions actually. 
I think, we think, that the road to Gull Island will be paved with the same rhetoric and corruption that existed for Muskrat Falls. Because the assessment laws are still weak and decisions are still made at the discretion of the minister and it's still very political. So I just put another um, uh, link there for um, a quote from our current CEO of now, of course, Dan Marshall, and he says, uh, uh, ready or not, Gull Island is coming sooner than you think. So Gull Island already has a green light with regards to environmental assessment. A review of the joint panel report will show that the panel was concerned that both projects were really not totally on the table. I've, I've given you a link down below it, uh, to the um, joint panel report if you're interested in reading that. The panel said because Gull Island and Muskrat Falls are subject to separate sanction decisions, the panel has assessed them separately with respect to alternatives, justification in energy and economic terms, and where possible with respect to other considerations. That's on page 23. Then on page 25 of that report, they say, the panel concludes that in light of uncertainties associated with the transmission for export markets from Gull Island, Nalcor has not demonstrated the justification of the project as a whole in energy and economic terms. And I put a little note, but if Hydro-Quebec was to provide transmission through Quebec, that could certainly change and very quickly. So some of the joint panel recommendations, I don't wanna go through a lot of them, there were 85 in total, but just to give you an idea of what the panel recommended and what did and didn't get done, one very strong recommendation was that Nalcor had not shown Muskrat Falls to be the least cost way to meet domestic demand, which was one of their justifications. And that was at a cost of 6.2 billion, which is how they, uh, the cost that was uh, on the table when the panel um, assess the project. It's now at 13.1 billion. They also said Nalcor had not demonstrated the justification of the project uh, as a whole in energy or economic terms, and that was again at 6.2 billion. They said it was both technically and economically feasible to carry out the full clearing of the Muskrat Falls Reservoir, and that was to mitigate methylmercury. That was not done. They recommended that Nalcor develop environmental flows so that the uh, uh, biodiversity and the ecology could survive, that was not done. They recommended removal of the soil and the vegetation, that was not done. They said the project would result in potentially irreversible signal, significant adverse environmental effects to fish habitat, and the final fish assemblage in both reservoirs. Much the same thing that the Department of Fisheries and Oceans said in a 1980 original environmental assessment on this same project. Nalcor said no effects beyond the mouth of the river. DFO, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans said mercury effects from the Churchill Falls project, which was online 30 years ago, could be seen in several species over 300 kilometers away. The panel said overall loss of terrestrial habitat would be significant and that the residual adverse effects on wetlands and riparian habitats is significant even after mitigation. And there are many more uh, uh, recommendations, way too many to discuss here, but I've left you the document um, uh, link so that you can go and uh, review it. So I question, how did the project actually get approved? In our opinion, this was a political decision. And in our opinion, most environmental assessment decisions in Canada are political decisions. The federal government of Canada had already presented NALCOR and the government of Newfoundland with the federal loan guarantee document, which forced the Newfoundland government to legislate that the people of the province would have to pay for muskrat falls through their hydro rates. At the same time, Peter McKay, a conservative, as was uh, Pre uh, Prime Minister Harper, was a minister in Nova Scotia. And the maritime link to Nova Scotia was a huge part of the federal loan guarantee that made a pro the project a regional project. That is why this project actually got approved, not because of the environmental damage and the environmental issues. So I, there are a lot of in, uh, negative impacts. Um, I'm just going to leave the, the slides in there. You can have a look at them. They're here, there, and yonder. 
these are just a few of the many, many impacts. Um, I'm going to skip over a couple of slides um, on that. And then I want to talk about this one, the near shore and ocean impacts. And this is from a new book called Blue Deserts by Stephen Kasperzak, who is from Maine, uh, Maine in the United States. And it talks about um, coastal systems and how they're the most biologically productive. Talks about spring runoff from rivers, about how that is the lifeblood of the coastal ecosystems, and how storing or hoarding spring runoff weakens the haline ocean currents like the Labrador current. It starves fisheries. It warms local and regional climates. It heat, there's heat pollution. And also that Hydro-Quebec knows they are hoarding the kinetic energy of the spring runoff. As a, a employee of Hydro-Quebec, Mr. Alain Soucy stated that northern projects would not work if they didn't hold the spring runoff for the use in winter. Roger Wheeler may be on this uh, webinar and I was unable to find the um, link to the document where Mr. Susi uh, made that statement, but I'm sure Roger would be able to help you. And he's with the Friends of Sebago Lake and he would help you with that if you need uh, information on that. Considering the past relations with Newfoundland, like I discussed the, the uh, really, serious feelings that they had against each other about how the Upper Churchill project was benefiting Quebec and not benefiting Newfoundland. Um, do you really think that making a deal with Quebec, uh, that Newfoundland would make a deal with Quebec to build Gull Island? That's a question I've asked myself and my opinion is absolutely yes. And why? Because right now they desperately need finances to pay for Muskrat and to help with um, social benefits because they are 13 point billion, uh, about to be 13 point billion more uh, in debt. They're already 14 billion in debt without Muskrat Falls. They will never be able to afford to develop Gull Island on their own. Engineers need to keep working, not only Newfoundland and Labradors, but Hydro-Quebecs or Quebecs, all the, in, the hydro engineers across the country. The Quebec government and Hydro-Quebec have always had plans for many more dams, and they also consider Labrador as their territory. They disagree with the 1927 Privy Council that gave Labrador to Newfoundland. And they will again see that the Newfoundland financial situation is being in their favor for a new lucrative contract, just as they did with the Upper Churchill project. So many countries, as well as Canada, are in a dam building frenzy, so to speak. The current capacity for hydroelectricity in Canada is around 100,000 megawatts, but technically and economically feasible, undeveloped hydro sites are about another 120,000 more, of which the currently proposed Gull Island project and the other 11 assessed rivers in Labrador are a part. This capacity is equal to 24 more projects the size of the Upper Churchill River, or the Upper Churchill Project. Other Canadian rivers will be facing the dams issue in the near future. Globally, over 3,500 dams are proposed, many in countries where opposition would be suppressed and often violently, unless we can stop the senseless destruction of rivers in Canada and consequently perhaps affect the global plans before it is too late. To our friends in the Northeastern states, we say every import of electricity involves an export of externalities. Labrador and its people reap the externalities or the negative impacts. Out of sight should never be out of mind. And here's my contact information. I'm happy to answer any questions you if I can, and if I can't, I can forward you somewhere where the questions can be answered. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Roberta. That was an amazing volume of information as usual from you. And we'll <laughs> turn it over to our next speaker, Dr. Gowdy.
Ian, are we ready to go? Seems he may have dropped off the call. Um, so I would suggest that we see if we can get him back on. Maybe Julian and Rachel can work on that. And in the meantime, we could move to a Q&A for these speakers so far. So if anyone has any speak questions for myself or for Roberta or Amy, you can raise your hand in the chat. I think that's how you do it. Or unmute yourself and feel free to ask a question. I will also jump in and just say I am I have the Facebook Live open. So if people are watching on Facebook, you can certainly type a question there and I will try and catch them. Good. Okay, any questions? Feel free to type them in the Zoom chat if you don't want to speak out. This is Meg. I will jump in and maybe ask Roberta if she can explain a little bit further uh, what the current status is with Muskrat Falls. I know that the schedule is behind two years uh, overdue for producing electricity and what some of the hangups are and when that might go um, online. Uh, as far as we know, um, they, they still have the synchronizing condenser issue, the, the uh, problem with um, um, uh, oh, unbalanced, it's, everything is unbalanced and so it doesn't work. We also know that uh, there's not even a chance that they're going to be able to produce power until late in 2021. Uh, we also learned today, by the way, that one of the um, uh, turbines has leaked oil into the river. And we also learned that that had happened back in February. And as far as I can tell up to today, up to this evening, uh, Nalcor did not report that. I, I'm not saying they didn't report it, but we haven't found um, a place where they've reported that. But, but they did report another leak of oil from one of the uh, turbines today. So there's two leaks of oil, we think, have happened so far. Um, the synchronizing condensers are not working yet. Uh, they have not been able to, um, to get the, uh, um, oh, when they have to link, what is the word I'm looking for? When they have to link the, um, the DC project from Muskrat Falls, from the transmission uh, of um, Muskrat Falls power to the power that's already on the island. They have not been able to do that yet, and that's through General Electric. So, um, yeah, so we, we're not sure where, where everything is. It's just uh, seems like the worst fiasco, um, you know, not only a fiasco financially from 6.2 billion to 13.1, but right on up to, you know, can't even keep the generators or the, the turbines from leaking. Makes no sense. Okay, thanks. We do have another question here in the chat box. We have a question, is there a price for Gull Island? What is the cost? Has it been sanctioned at a certain price? Sanctioned for those of you in the US means approved. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that last part, but <clears throat> as far as the price of Bell Island, Island, no, 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 it has not been, it has not been released. Uh, I doubt they even know. And after going from 6.2 to 13.1, I doubt anybody would believe anything they said anyway. But uh, the Gull Island project won't be quite as extensive, although it's 300 feet high rather than 100 feet. But apparently it's an easier project to build with a lot less um, um, construction issues and uh, almost three times more power. So it would have been a cheaper per unit project. 
and we can't figure out yet why Nalcor went with Muskrat Falls rather than Gull Island, except for the fact that they couldn't make a deal with Hydro-Quebec to uh, wheel power over their transmission lines. So that's, that's the only reason we can figure out why um, Gull Island went ahead, I mean uh, Muskrat Falls went ahead of Gull Island, because Gull Island is a cheaper per unit of energy um, by far than Muskrat Falls. But no okay, price. Great. Thank yes. you, Roberta. And it looks like we have Dr. Gowdy back. He's um, connected to audio and he'll be screen sharing in a minute. And I think we're ready to go. Cool. Hmm. Looks like we're still having audio connection issues with Dr. Gowdy. So, oh, the screen sharing. But can we hear him? While we wait for his audio to come back, I'm just gonna read a question that we got from John on Facebook. Um, he asked, what message would you send to the coalition of Northeastern governors? So personally, I would say, um, I would just kind of echo a lot of what Roberta said at the end of her piece, where she, you know, every, every you know transmission corridor you really have to be thinking um globally in terms of what your impacts are you know the power doesn't magically appear um, at the border you have to think about what happens at the other end of the transmission line and you know personally i was really grateful for um, the work that namra does um, in the united states in getting our message out there to kind of explain what's been going on up here in Labrador because it kind of makes those connections so you can see what's happening at the other end of these transition corridors. So I would just say don't, you know, think broader, think beyond your state borders. Um, and it looks like Dr. Gowdy's back. So go right ahead. Okay. Are we hearing me? Yes, we can hear Yes? You. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm very sorry about that. I have no idea what went wrong there. We have the screen back. So thank you for inviting me to participate. Um, it was good to have those presentations to get a little general idea of what the interests may be and, and how I might be able to contribute to them. Um, I have a long, uh, history uh, of, of work in, in Labrador, and I did a lot of uh, research on waterfowl and wetlands uh, in Labrador, and particularly uh, in the Upper Churchill and, and the Lower Churchill. Um, I had a 20-year career with, the, with Environment Canada, and then after that uh, I was in private uh, consulting. The um, I think uh, I was invited in part to, to give this presentation uh, because more recently I've been science advisor for the uh, not-for-profit For New Earth, uh, which is run by uh, Dr. Sean McGraw, Department of Philosophy at Memorial University. Um, 
I wrote an article in there on the failure of the environmental assessment uh, process and it profiled uh, muskrat falls. Um, I have a lot of intricate experience with working through the aspects of environmental impact studies and environmental assessment, both from conducting those as well as from being on the inside and, and seeing how they're handled within government. Um, <clears throat> some of this, what I had on, on my slides here, I think it's been touched on uh, by Roberta, so I don't want to be too redundant. Uh, the, um, as you know, the panel uh, did direct NALCOR to address downstream effects um, and uh, it also uh, felt that clearing of the reservoir could have been achieved um, and that significant other things could have been undertaken by the company. Uh, but in the end, uh, uh, essentially very, very little was done. And there was never really uh, any kind of uh, proper rationale to justify the lack of treatment of downstream effects of the Lower Churchill uh, project. But I just w wanted to back up a little bit to say, you know, as a, as a scientist, you know, working to try to quantify impacts of uh, hydroelectrical developments, uh, and then, you know, to try to help with the environmental assessment of these projects, you bump into a lot of uh, myths. And uh, one of them, of course, which you all know, is that hydroelectricity is green energy. Uh, that's certainly the biggest myth. Um, but you commonly will hear uh, proponents of hydroelectricity say that dams result in wetlands forming at higher water levels. And this is an absolute myth. Um, there's also the notion that animals that are displaced from inundations can go elsewhere, which is also a myth. And of course, with especially with the Lower Churchill, we saw that uh, the company was claiming uh, no downstream effects. And um, dams result in, in unnatural fluctuations in, in water levels in, uh, in the systems they're in. And, and just because of that, everything in the ecosystem uh, within the uh, inundated area, as well as downstream of the uh, dams, uh, everything really goes awry. And uh, um, there's really no, uh, without some form of mitigation to try to reduce those impacts uh, downstream and above dam effects are pretty major on, on ecosystems. Um, we know, of course, there's been a lot of focus on the methylmercury. Uh, that wasn't really the, the area that I was focused on. I was focused a lot on the wetlands, um, particularly the Delta and, and all of the uh, wetlands in the Upper Lake Melville area. Um, but we start to find that uh, when you roll these things into a bigger picture, uh, the reservoirs become, um, uh, they remain frozen a lot longer than the uh, river, river line systems that they've inundated. And they actually can cause regional uh, changes in, in uh, weather patterns. Um, and then even on a bigger scale, uh, these systems are changing the water regimes that are going out to the ocean and the set and the uh, <clears throat> the sediment and nutrient loads that are going into the ocean um, get completely reversed and there's mounting evidence that this is probably a major contributing factor to the global warming phenomenon that's particularly pronounced in the north uh, because one of the um, 
aspects of global warming is that we know that it's happening at a much higher rate in the Arctic than it is in uh, more southern areas. And there hasn't been a lot of good explanation as to why that might be. And the amount of mega damming in the north could potentially explain that. One of the greatest disappointments of, of the, uh, of the uh, Muskrat Falls environmental impact statement was the lack of integration of all of the good work that had gone into the uh, World Commission on Dams. <clears throat> it was as if the, the environmental team that Nalcor had amassed decided at some point that they were ignoring everything that the World Commission had provided. Um, because spelled right out there, you know, in, in the document, and it's even in its executive summary, is that one of the most devastating effects of dams are the downstream effects. Mm -hmm. But it also had recommended the importance of having a science-based approach for these projects and they were to be guided by a precautionary principle because the full nature of the impacts that you can get from these dam developments are difficult to predict with any kind of uh, accuracy. And so proponents are advised to embrace the uh, scientific uncertainty of those effects. And then uh, if we're, if these proponents are to mitigate uh, environmental effects, somehow reduce them or eliminate them, then there has to be some proper attention to the science that is able to measure those effects in the first place. And um, there's, when, when the, um, when environmental first emerged uh, in the uh, late, uh, mid to late 70s, and then I think the legislation started to get more entrenched in the, in the 80s, you know, federally and provincially, it had a, a science-based approach. That was the whole concept of it, was that somehow science was gonna lead into defining what, these impacts were going to be and then by knowing what these impacts were going to be it would become more possible to figure out how to reduce or eliminate them and so they had things uh there was particularly a lot of work done by uh, a doctor uh, roger green out of the university of western ontario who developed this uh, study approach called a, a, a before after control impact or backy uh, optimal study design and so for these study designs to work you have to have something that's being measured it's being measured in the system that's about to be altered but it's also being measured at the same time in a system that's not being altered and that that's the control and and so both systems are studied before the project chain before the project is undertaken um, and then after the project is undertaken so that the differences that may show up can be clearly linked to whatever that development was but we don't see any of this taking place now in, in our environmental assessments well, rather what we see is just a lot of money being spent to produce a very glossy, uh, nice looking document that basically quantifies a lot, of, uh, a lot of the environmental things that are out there. And for the most part does very little to actually um, study or quantify indicators that may be used to measure impacts. So um, these ecosystem indicators or site selection indicators are critical to any kind of study that 
it's uh, trying to measure impacts. And part of the output uh, of the World Commission on Dams stressed the importance of environmental flow releases or environmental flow regimes. And I noticed Roberta mentioned that these were also touched on by the panel. If these dams are, are to somehow be designed to reduce impacts on the environment, they have to incorporate into them some form of release of water that helps to mimic the seasonal flows of water that are occurring. So that would mean, for example, at Muskrat Falls that um, in spring, when you normally would have your heavy uh, snow melt and runoff, that there should be um, something built into the design of that so that large amounts of water can be spilled to, uh, to flood the floodplains below the dam and the delta. But we see nothing of any sort like this in the uh, in in those in the output from the uh, from Malcor. Uh, this was a figure that I had uh, <clears throat> developed for the uh, downstream effects study model that. Uh, uh, I was involved with that did make it to the um, environmental management team at Melcor, although none of the recommendations or approaches suggested in that were ever adopted. <clears throat> but um, the red in, in the figure um, up in Goose Bay area indicates the actual extent of, of uh, wetlands in the delta of the uh, Churchill or Grand River. <clears throat> and then over on this side, on a on somewhat smaller scale, you see, you see some coastal wetlands. And then over here, this was the area at the time that I was suggesting could potentially be used as a control um, for the, uh, for the uh, lower Churchill. And the idea of that would be that if, if you could define what the variation in runoff and sediment deposition was for this system, and at the same time for this system, then after the development, you would be able to have a measure of what the impacts were. <clears throat> but I, it's a very large system and it has, it's roughly uh, 52.3 square kilometers of delta and intertidal wetlands, all this area up in here, which will all be impacted. So we see with the, um, with the damming of these systems that we have a, a reduction of, of flow and, and a removal of, of its seasonal variability. Um, for a system like the Lower Churchill, uh, there's a huge amount of sediment loading in that system. And so there's gonna be massive change in that. And that's never really been addressed. All of that, at the best of times, the, uh, the Lower Churchill River is, is a very turbid river. Uh, it's not clear water. It's always carrying a sediment load. Uh, so all the sediment's gonna, gonna be deposited above the dam. Um, the spilling of water from these dams is, is unnatural and usually occurs at times of the year when normally you wouldn't get downstream uh, flooding events. So that becomes problematic. And then uh, you end up with little uh, or no um, overbank flooding like you normally would have that maintains all of that delta and, and wetland system. And then the nutrient supply it itself, which comes with those sediment loads. So, you know, there's potentially solutions that, it, that could help reduce those impacts. 
um, which are particularly related to environmental flow releases that had to be environmentally designed and built into the operation of a system like uh, muskrat falls that could help reduce those uh, impacts. They're not going to eliminate them all, but they're going to certainly uh, be helpful to maintain some of the wetlands and all its uh, waterfall and associated things downstream. Part of that requires finding indicator species that can be used to indicate the health of, of the system. None of that has been done. And along with the scientific uh, recommendations that I had in that report, um, I also included the concept of and, and defined the importance of trying to develop some way to support the environmental work that would be needed and that could be done. Um, suggested things like an environmental trust fund that the proponent would, would have to establish and pay into the establishment of an independent scientific body to look at the research and, and apply adaptive management as, as findings emerge um, and to develop cooperative research with academic institutions. There's also, the, I also recognized based on, on my extensive experience in working in Newfoundland, Labrador on wetlands that the inner Lake Melville, Lower Churchill River Delta, you know, the wetlands there are of international importance. And I, rec I recommended in that report that consideration be given to registering those under the International Ramsar uh, Wetland Convention as wetlands of international importance. And then importantly, there would be a, a need for a system of independent auditing of the environmental performance of any of these uh, measures that were taken. So that's the general overview of my involvement there. Um, I could say a lot about, uh, you know, the process of how these EISs end up being the way they are. Um, but, you know, the, the failure of the Muskrat Falls environmental assessment is also a failure of science because the environmental assessment process, although it was created in a scientific vein has has progressively evolved to be not scientific and uh, so for example when we look at the um, environmental management group of the NALCOR uh, EIS um, the main people that were making key decisions in in there were only were not were, were billing out as senior scientists uh, when in fact um, they were not senior scientists, they were at best holding a bachelor level degree. So they lacked the scientific background to really put anything scientific in place. And these same people are also screening out all the information that's coming into them from subcontractors that are working on different things that may be trying to get attention to key things that are um, likely to be heavily impacted. As an example, uh, uh, we brought a lot of attention to the obvious negative impacts that were going to occur on the Ashqui, which are open, uh, areas of water that occur early in spring before the general uh, ice out occurs. So in the lower Churchill system, you have many areas where these open areas form and they are key to waterfall uh, uh, staging through the, uh, through the Lake Melville uh, ecoregion area. And all of these would uh, 
disappear as a result of the uh, Muskrat Falls and, and Gull Island projects. We identified, um, let me see, I had some figures on it. We identified about uh, almost 1,500 acres of wetlands that would be inundated as a result of the Gull Island uh, inundation. And we recommended that um, a mitigation be, be researched and engineered that would reduce the inundation by seven meters in order to maintain those wetlands. That was ignored. And to be honest, uh, you know, when you're out there on the ground and you're working and you're trying to do things and, and provide meaningful input, what you start to feel is that all your work really is not getting past the prime uh, contractor who's really filtering all of that information that's coming in and what actually makes it into the boardroom at Nalcor is, is precious little of what's actually going on on the ground. So the whole thing is, is a failure of science as well as a failure of the environmental assessment process because at the end of the day you end up with a document that basically is saying there's no impacts and it's all good to go. Okay, I'll, uh, I'm gonna stop there on that little rant. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Gowdy. It wasn't good news, but it's really great to be informed about that. One of the things that often um, get said by the hydro industry and by regulators here in the US is that the environmental review process in Canada is rigorous and very robust, but it certainly appears to me that it, it is not. And I'd also like to note that here in the US, dams, hydroelectric dams are regulated by FERC, a federal agency, and they have 40-year permits, and those permits have to be renewed, and the companies have to apply for relicensing. And there is a public process, not perfect, of course, but for example, with the Upper Churchill Dam that Hydro-Quebec is using as one-sixth of its hydro supply, much of which is exported into the US, there was never a, an environmental review as, as the speakers have noted and the dam was built without the knowledge or consent of the Labrador Innu and that dam is good to go in perpetuity. It will never have to face any relicensing by any Canadian regulator and there are no permit conditions that I'm aware of that would require NALCOR and Hydro-Quebec to go back and mitigate, provide a fish ladder, provide any kind of compensation for the extensive damage and flooding and so forth. And even as science is evolving, Hydro-Quebec is able to continue operating its mega dams and NALCOR operating the Upper Churchill um, with complete disregard for current science and no way for those of us in the public interest to bring those concerns forward once these dams start operating. Correct. Mm -hmm. So we'll put that out for questions and answers and maybe that's a conversation starter. We have a few more minutes um, for questions from the audience. I see one here um, from Roger Wheeler. Are there any studies being done like Hans Nui did to quantify ocean current changes when freshwater flow is stored in the spring and released in the winter? Dr. Gowdy, would you like to take that? I'm not aware of, of any actual studies of that. 
um, but it is a seriously important issue and um, needs a lot of attention. Uh, I'm not aware of any studies that are actually looking at that. We have a similar question um, from folks in British Columbia. BC Hydro has failed to allow releases of water to recreate environmental flows as, as well on the Peace River. Does this actually happen anywhere? Um, I, I'll take that question, I guess. Uh, yes. I was involved in a study in south, uh, in southern Newfoundland on the island of Newfoundland in Upper Salmon Hydroelectric Project. And in that project, um, partly based on the work we were doing on this delta, um, Newfoundland Hydro did engineer a drawdown canal uh, at a site called Godlick Pond. And this drawdown canal, in fact, worked to prevent the uh, flooding of this delta. Um, so that one did, uh, that one was an example of a mitigation that worked at least to a certain extent. And I did publish on that uh, and I could pass that information along. Great, good. Another question, um, what can we do to change the environmental assessments in Canada and get proper assessments completed? Anyone want to take that on? Well, uh, I would say that there has to be a more fundamental um, uh, we somehow a more f fundamental accountability to the science of the in environmental impact statement uh, undertaken itself. And, you know, I think that that's a really difficult area because um, we have, it's, it's, it's the industry itself that is driving that and it, it's controlling that, you know, through its, uh, through its consultants. So I think I mentioned in the article on the failure of environmental assessment that it's, it's about the engineering firms who now offer the environmental ass assessment uh, uh, services under under another wing, but really the agenda is to develop, develop, develop. And so there's the information control that's going on, and then that information is distorted. And um, at the end of the day, a minister has a document on his desk that appears to uh, to meet all of the requirements that he needs. And so I think that the failure is not as much in the legislation as it is in the actual um, the consulting process itself and the corporate process itself. And so I, I think it's a very difficult uh, area to try to uh, address. And we see that kind of corporate uh, um, co-opting of environmental um, conservation and environmental concerns going on in a lot of different forms in the world today. Any other questions? There were two kind of similar questions um, about what can we do to resist or stop the Gull Island project. Um, I just realized I had my video off, sorry. And I just wanted to touch on this because I think it's an important kind of takeaway to have like really actionable items and what you can do from here on out. Um, 
So to the folks who may be tuning in from the United States, I would say to really, um, you know, focus on your representative, talk to your governors, see what transmission corridors are being proposed. You know, there's a lot of proposed transmission corridors happening right now, um, whether that's like Kippy or, you know, Meg can talk more about this, but essentially what I'm saying is <laughs> talk to your representatives on every level and, you know, get it in their ears right now that you do not want Canadian hydropower. And here's the reasons why. And talk about what's happening upstream. You know, talk about what's happening to us up here. Um, and to folks, you know, closer to home, if you're tuning in from Newfoundland Labrador, I would say resist it by any means necessary. <laughs> so whether that's <laughs> um, you know, talking to the government officials, whether that's blockades, like, I think we need to do whatever it takes to stop it. Um, you know, the world's in a weird place right now with COVID stuff. So in-person action might be like not the best idea right now, but like, you know, stay tuned. We're going to make sure this doesn't go ahead. Like we have no other choice as far as I'm concerned. Um, so yeah, just, I think to really like keep it always in your mind, you know, help by any means necessary. Um, and maybe that's financially, like, you know, a lot of us are fundraising for legal fees still. So that's something you can help with. Um, but yeah, by any means necessary, we'll stop it. Way to go. Thanks, Amy. So it's 8.30 and we're scheduled to wrap up. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. And don't forget, we have two more webinar is coming up and a third one on site C in early October will be talking about the economic and cultural and environmental impacts of that mega dam. So stay in touch. Our email information is here on the last slide and we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And thanks so much for your interest. Good night and good work. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.